Oh, well, thanks for jumping on, boys. Carabin, it's changed a bit over the journey. We're in a $30 million new facility now, which is unbelievable. What are your, what are your memories, some of your memories walking through the doors for the first time in 94 and 95? Well, definitely wasn't a $30 million facility. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, I think Yarra Wonga would have been proud of the facility back, back when I walked through the door. It was just a uh, one change room, a, a bit of an open area, and on the side, a, a pretty small sort of gym. So Obviously, the, the four of us walking through the doors and, and seeing Harvey and Burke and Lowe and Winmar and Frawley um, with we'd only ever seen on telly and, and that's what happens obviously with young draftees coming into the system still these days. Getting a locker next to uh, the idols. A um, couple of memories from me, I, I still remember Lowy leading out a couple of times at training and, and I was that nervous that I would muck the kick up and a couple of times I did and he grabbed me once and said, Brownie, don't worry about it, just back yourself and just put it out in front and I'll get it. And it was just instilling that belief in me very early on that yeah, I belonged and that I, that I was good enough to do it. And yeah, Lowy was a standout for me as well as Spud in that. Um, but they were always pretty good on the feedback too. Um, what about you guys? You got some memories of those four? Oh, mate, the, the first one I'm going to say is you must have got a pretty good number to get a locker next to idols. I think I was in between Wayne Thornber and Jamie Elliott for the first year. So <laughs> not too many... Not too many conversations they come up these days. Good fellas, but... Uh, what number were you, Oz? Did you... Were you 20-something? 20, uh, 29 early days, mate. So, uh, just just down in the back stall. So, yeah. um, mate, mine, mine's probably a little bit different. I actually... Uh, I played a game at Waverley and didn't didn't go too well. Probably let myself down a little bit, to be honest. I actually got a phone call from Nicky Wimmer that, that night. Probably not really seen for doing a lot of that sort of stuff, cuz, but... He was, he was huge for me behind the scenes. Obviously, you know, the other guys you've mentioned have been, um, you know, great, great leaders of the club. But for me, Cuz probably had the biggest influence out of, out of all. And sort of took me under my wing a bit. I suppose we played similar positions, different footy, but similar positions. And he saw a bit in me. And I, uh, I've spoken to Cuz about this. And I thank him, thank him a lot at the time because, yeah, he was, he was huge for me. Have you told any... I never knew that, Aussie. Was that, is that a... Have you told too many people about that, or? Oh, not, not really, mate. It's, yeah. I suppose you know when you when you're out and about, you might even sort of be you know at the pub with a few mates, and people go, they ask about you know the guys you played with, and I just sort of tell that that story about Nicky, I suppose, yeah. because he he doesn't get much credit for all that sort of stuff. But it was it was in my first year, and it actually it actually gave me a fair bit of confidence after that because I thought, well, Nicky's, Nicky's seen what I can do, but he's seen yeah. that I was pretty, pretty ordinary today and put a bit of time into making sure that, you know, I knew what I could do and make sure the standards were high all the time rather than sort of, sort of up and down. And, yeah, no, I really appreciate well, it. Well, Cuz naturally gravitated towards the, the younger guys, didn't he? So it's, yeah. it's no surprise at all, that, especially with yourself, that, um, that he was able to give you that feedback. Yeah, awesome. great. Great man, Cars. Great man. They're um, they're all Hall of Famers, those blokes. Right? For, like St Kilda Hall of Fame, but also AFL Hall of Fame caliber blokes. And mm. the one who stood like Harves is obviously two time Brownlow medalist, one of all those best and fairest. But the one that I look back on after I finished coaching the <coughs> AFL is Stewie Lowe. What he was able to do, um, the way he played the game. They're, they're rare, those blokes who are that mm. contested in marking contests. They're so hard to find these days. And I look back on him now and I think, wow, he was an unbelievable player. And, you know, it wouldn't matter what era he played in. Um, yeah. His hands yeah. were so big. I've got a photo where he, I kicked the goal and he puts his two hands around my head. <laughs> I can't even see my head. Um, I just think he's a good star, Stewie. It'd be, it'd be great to see him in the modern-day footy, just how he would adapt and just that, that size and the physique. And he obviously yeah. had, had really good endurance too. So, yeah. Yeah, well, that, it's probably only about 20 contested marks a game nowadays. So, But he's so good at it that a team would build probably their game plan around his ability to yeah. contest marks. Yeah. Well, I remember it was a pretty uh, a weird feeling first day walking into a new footy club, uh, isn't it? And especially when, you know, I know St Kilda were down near the bottom of the ladder, but you've got probably five. Uh, you've probably got half of the Victorian state of origin team sitting in the change rooms. And I think the one thing that, 
you know, we'd grown up playing with kids all our life, so everyone's all about the same size. But just walking into that change room, uh, I think at the time they were, they were doing a weight session, but just the size of the guys. I, I don't think any of us realise, you know, the size of Stewie Lowe, the size of, you know, <laughs> they're just big men. Um, that's probably the thing that hit me first and foremost when I walked through the door was we're in sort of a man's world now, we're playing a men's game. What were you weighing when you walked in? Can you remember? Oh, yeah. I, was, I think I was, weighing, I was weighing a bit more than you. Uh, oh, 63 but, uh, kilos. I would, have, I would have had a seven in front of it, you know, maybe 78 or 79. Yeah, so, 63 for me. Yeah. 63. What were you, Brownie? Yeah, 68. 68, Jones? 63 when I walked in the yeah. door. Wow. <laughs> Whippets, that's why, that's why they look so big. <laughs> <laughs> Spud, our first captain, obviously tragic circumstances last year with, with the big fella leaving us, but um, my memory of the big fella was you, you didn't speak out of line and if you did, you, you'd get put into place pretty quick and the uh, the spar and the sauna, the, you remember the sledge box being invited in there? <laughs> It was very, very rare that I think any of us got in there, but when it, when we did, it was yeah, some very, very funny stories and a lot of banter. It's funny, though, because when you did get an invite and you like you figure out that it was a sledge box and you think about how many times you didn't get invited, you know yeah. your name was being thrown up, being <laughs> sledged against pretty heavy. Well, from memory, I think, Brownie, you're the only one who ever got an invite into that little link in sanctum. So. <laughs> I, never, I never went in. No, nah, I never, I never went, went in. He's the funniest man I've ever met, Spud. Um, and what you saw on the TV was just exactly who he was. But I reckon as the captain, I played on him for two years, he had the balance right between yeah. when to have fun and get everyone laughing and then when to be really serious. And um, he's a competitive man and also hilarious. Some of the stories I can remember of him on the training t- track, just cracking up the boys was um, brilliant. Awesome. Yeah, brilliant man. Good captain. Obviously, us other three only had him for the for the year, but he was... It was brilliant, and like Lapo said, you know that that balance. I, I won't I won't tell the story, but obviously our first Mad Monday, Brownie and Joel. I don't know if you remember at the Brighton, and Spud led the way there too as well. I think we might have walked in about three minutes late, and yeah, Jug waiting for us each. So I think Wooden Spoon in '95 uh, finished down the bottom, and then '96 we come out and had a good pre-season and. And beat beat the blue baggers in the Ansett Cup Premiership out at Waverley. Do you remember how many people were there that night? Fifty-five thousand. Yeah, yeah, that's a guess. Is that right? I, I would say yeah, fifty-five, <laughs> sixty thousand. <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I think the I think the biggest shock for all like we're only young fellas then. I was only eighteen. I think we're all eighteen. Lapo. Maybe a little bit older, but um, it was probably the drive out to the ground along North Road and it was just bumper to bumper of cars and every car had two or three Saints flags hanging out the windows and you could just see the joy on, you know, all the supporters' faces that you know, would probably hit home a little bit of you know, how long it has been since, you know, they really had something to, to celebrate in terms of, you know, potential winning a, a cup, even though it was only, I guess, a, a pre-season, it had just been a long time and... Um, you know, you could see, definitely see and feel the joy of that night. Yeah, well, it was unbelievable. I remember standing on the podium afterwards and just looking around, there was just thousands and thousands of people. And, yep, probably you don't know how much it meant to, to everyone then and it was the first silverware since 66. So, yeah, great memory. The long gap for any type of silverware, isn't it? You know, 30 yeah, years for absolutely. for any of them. But, uh, yeah, no, it was, a, it was a good night. Good to be out there. Stan Elves as a coach. He, uh, he wrote a book. I'm not sure if you guys have read it. But um, he probably I didn't realise how good he was until he left. Um, but could give a spray, Stanley. Some memories of our first coach. <laughs> Oh, I'm I'm happy to go here first because obviously I had a pretty good relationship with with Elsie. Um, I owe a fair bit of my career to to Stan, but I remember my my first game was actually round one '95. We played West Coast in Perth. They were the reigning premiers, 
And we we obviously ended up with the with a wooden spoon. So we've gone over there as massive underdogs, and we were down by a quarter by a point at half time. I'm sort of thinking, you know, first game, we're going to ride right here, going to ride. Right. I think Alves will be pretty happy. And I've walked into him giving David Grant the most almighty spray. I don't, I don't know if you've heard about it or remember it on the day, but it was absolutely massive. Um, to this day, the biggest spray I've ever seen from a coach. And I thought, holy shit, we're going to ride right here. And uh, this is what I'm in for for the rest of my career, sprays like that. So uh, um, that's one one memory of Alvesy sprays. But like I said, I, I got along with him well, mate. Know a lot of my career doing. Yeah, great. Thanks, Alvesy. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was at that game, Aussie. The paint was peeling off the walls. That was one of the all-time great yeah. sprays. Um, I, I like Stan as well. Um, he, he did a really um, he did a lot for my career early on. I, looking back on him, I think he was um, innovative and he was prepared to take risks yeah. um, with his coaching, which um, looking back on, I really respect that. So, you know, he was the first person to embrace leading teams in the AFL and that's gone on to be um, pivotal in 20 years worth of um, you know, team success in the AFL, Geelong, Hawthorne, Sydney, all of those teams. So I thought he was really... Um, innovative in that space, which was, um, we, and we were, you know, we're at the forefront of that. And I thought it was a really good program for our footy club. Yeah. And he, if you'd probably look back now, it's probably not the easiest gig. He had, he had a, a team full of either at one end superstars or at the other end, 17, 18, 19 year olds who, who are just learning the craft. So, you know, and we've all, we've all got kids ourselves now and we know, you know, how frustrating they can be at the, at the best of times. So, um, it was never going to be an easy gig trying to, I guess, fast track kids and try and bring a team from, from the bottom of the ladder and all the way to the top of the ladder within, you know, a space of two and a half years. So um, I think you can look back at his time and go, he's done a pretty good job. Well, even, even sort of back at Lapo up when he, Lapo sort of mentioned the, the innovation, I, I sort of, whenever I speak about Alvesy to people, I sort of credit him a fair bit of clubs going to the draft really heavy and taking kids because obviously... Even the year, Lapo's year, there were some, some kids. And then our year was pretty much all, all kids. You know, they picked up a couple of boys from SA that had played a bit of footy. But with the early picks, they went, they went kids. And I reckon, I reckon Elsie was a bit of a front runner there too, obviously with Johnny Beveridge, um, of, of going to kids and developing from within and back in your own sort of system to, to get boys up. So I reckon Elsie was, uh, yeah, out in front there as well. He didn't get them all right. Do you remember, do you remember William Chung? No. <laughs> Chung had the one-inch punch. So that was an innovation he didn't get right. He tried to one-inch punch Barry Hall into the wall. But then the other one is meditation, Brownie. So in 98, he, was, he brought in transcendental meditation or whatever. So, yeah. But a lot of AFL teams are doing that sort of stuff now. I mean, it's all optional, but that sort of stuff is in AFL clubs at the moment. So he was a fair, fair bit ahead of his time there. I agree. I, I remember it was optional just before a game about visual, visualisation. You, uh, yeah. you had to lie in a dark room on the, on the cold floor at Waverley and just see yourself doing something good. And it was, there's was probably 10 or 12 blokes each game that would do that and the others would take the piss out of it and laugh. Yeah, <laughs> Spider Everett exercised his option not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> the next one, lights out at Waverley. I did the... Three of you guys played that night. I played. Yeah, I played. I played both of them. Did you play both lap, or did you just come in on the Tuesday? I just came in for the, uh, <laughs> for the Tuesday night game, so I got the matchy. And yeah. only had to play a quarter and a half. <laughs> I do remember we got two match payments, so that was a bonus. Did you we? Know, yeah, did we? I, I can't just remember. Landing Mo's Saturday night, having a few drinks, thinking what's going to happen here, and then somebody tapped us on the shoulder and said, "Boys." There's a chance you're going to be playing in a couple of days, so sharpen yeah. up. <laughs> no, no offence, Lobo, but I think there was only one change made to both sides. We brought you in, and they brought Herd. I think I think we missed out. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't argue with that. I, I, I won't even try. I won't even try. And do you know who got a Brownlow vote that that game? I believe James Herd did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> I played a, qu- played a quarter and a half. I think at the time close. it stopped. I was I was half forward and Mark Harvey, he was half back. So I was playing with Harvey. You know, when you grow up watching footy as a 15, 16, 17 year old, you know, Mark Harvey was one of the um, most fearsome sort of competitors out there. So when you're as 
as an 18 year old playing against him, you're obviously a little bit nervous. And I, I remember the lights went out and I said to Harves, I said, oh, what do we do now? And he's going, oh, we might as well start a fight. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I ran that way and he ran that way. Hey, the Saints faithfuls knocked the posts over and started burning them. Yeah, yeah. they did start a fire. Yeah. Madness. The uh, 97 final series. Um, unfortunately, Joel, you, you were watching and I think we probably would have all had little tattoos on our ankles, maybe if you were playing and and Spy were playing in the, in the, the grand final. But yeah, the, the prelim final, Oz and Lap, you in front of about 90,000 against North. That was a pretty awesome night, wasn't it? Yeah, it was It was huge. Obviously, to get the result too, and it was reasonably comfortable, so you could sort of enjoy the the last little bit. Um, I actually finished on the on the pine. I was with I was with Shannon's, and I went nuts, and he sort of sort of reined me in a little bit. Uh, I suppose no one really knows what the reaction's meant to be. Mine was my honest reaction. I was pumped. We were going to Granny the the following one Saturday, and Shannon's probably been a bit of a serious head. Was like, no, nah, let's rein it in. We've got a we've got a week to go, but no, nah, it was it was huge, and that that excitement to know you're going to the big dance of the final week was was massive. Yeah, big win. Brownie, um, I remember it was, I think it was wet and sticky conditions and I remember Jason Heatley kicked the bag. So, um, yeah, the crowd was going nuts. We were jumping, carrying on like pork chops and, I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. We were just so excited and yeah. that excitement carried into the next week as well. And, um, in, look, it probably hurt us the week later because um, we didn't really know what we were doing. We had no experience in that environment. But, um, you know, it was still something that was awesome for us all to uh, experience and achieve. Mm. And, Joel, I don't, I don't think... I've probably asked you about it over the years, but what, what was your feeling deep down inside knowing that you weren't going to run out with us? Oh, it's bloody hard, Brownie. It's, it's a, mm. one of those bittersweet feelings that, you, you know... You, you're pretty happy and, and pumped that the boys are, and the team has got into the granny. But then if, you know, I guess personally, you, you're absolutely shattered. So um, so it's a, it's a pretty hard sort of experience to go through sitting on the sidelines. And I'm not the first guy who's sat on the sidelines. There's been many before me, whether it's from injury or being dropped or uh, you just haven't been good enough. So um, unfortunately, that's, that's how team sports goes. You if you're fit enough on the day, you get your chance. If you're not, you know, you're on the sidelines. So you've got to take a, a pretty sort of simple approach towards it all. Um, have your moment of let, letting your emotion out, which I remember doing. It probably all come out for me. I haven't probably spoken to too many people. Not too many people have probably even seen. Um, but, but at half time, or just before half time, I was, in the, I was in the players' race just on my own. And I can remember probably... At that stage, oh, I can't remember, but you know the Saints were were a long way in front, um, coming in at sort of half time or three quarter time, and just bawling my eyes out for for ten minutes or so. Um, just the emotion of it all got to me, and you know with the boys being so far in front, I, I just thought I, I have missed my opportunity. Mm. Um, I think the other the other battle is is at the time I was only twenty, so you know when I look back now. <coughs> You don't have a lot of life skills, so you know you're only, even though you're 20, you're only a kid yourself. And it was probably the first time, uh, you know, in my life that I, I experienced such a horrific injury, but probably a horrific life moment, I guess. Mm. Um, so I was going through a lot of life lessons that I guess at the time I, I didn't have the skills. Um, and you know, as good as the Saints were and, and you boys were around me, you know, the clubs are a lot different nowadays to what they were back then. Um, there's a lot more resources, there's a lot more um, education and knowledge and understanding and, of how to, you know, help and support the boys. Um, so I think in some ways, you know, at that time, as good as the support is, you are a little bit lonely. Um, yeah, so it was an interesting little period. But, you know, we all get through it. Yeah, well, you come out the other end probably uh, bigger and stronger and your resilience is one thing I, I remember you... You're absolute credit to yourself with how you dealt with it. So, I think we all got pretty good at table tennis in your in your garage <laughs> with the, the couch. <laughs> Still undefeated. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Doran, 
Channel Seven, Oz. He uh, he knocked on our door grand final morning. I I can't remember if anyone organised that or he just turned up, but I can't remember organising it. It was a bit of a shock. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if it was organised or whatever. Obviously, the club didn't have a a media department. Oh, I reckon it gets blown out of the water a, a fair bit. Um, obviously, it's not a it's not a great look having a a journo in. In your house with a few of the players, the the morning of a of a grand final. But basically, as soon as you walked out the door, it was the last time we we thought of it. You know, the the distraction mm. of a, a big crowd of the AFL, the, the build up, and um, how important grand final day is. Anything that sort of happened in the morning just doesn't doesn't come back to mind at at all. So you know, I've, every time the ninety seven granny comes up, you know, the Saints supporters speak about it, but. I don't reckon it affected anyone that was there and we just sort of got on with it with the job. And like I said, as soon as you get to the G, you know, your focus is purely on, on that game because you know how important it is. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. Pretty funny looking back on it now <clears throat> when uh, when it appears in on social media. Um, actually ran into Mark Doran last year. Uh, he lives in Perth now and he had a good chat to me about it, asking for a member and so I certainly did on do you remember the police escort that we all got in for the yeah. parade the, the day before? Yeah, it was impressive. Very, very impressive. Just driving down the uh, Nepean Highway, just all the way. No red lights. The, the <laughs> cop was just going down the side, blocking the roads and just, just getting a free run. It was, uh, it was like rock stars. It was on the bus that day. Right, the biggest characters that you played with over the years at the, the Mighty Saints. Right, oh, we'll start. Big, big good brownie. A bit of it for me. Big Lazar. Yeah, big Lazar. Yeah, it was, big Lazar. He, he, I think the first day I was at the club, he introduced himself and said, Brownie, how old are you? And I said, I'm, I'm 17, Lazar. I'll get my licence uh, in May. And he said, well, when you get your first car, he said, I don't do it, but I know someone when you start, come time to sell, <laughs> need your domino wound back. He goes, I can get it done for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, eh? this bloke's a character and it absolutely was. I spoke earlier about Spud, funniest man I've seen in footy. Um, but the other one who I think about is Dirty Villa. Dirty yeah, Villa. He, was, yeah. he was a classic clubman. He gave everything he had on the field or off the field. Didn't matter whether it was a game of cricket, um, going out for a drink, barbecue, training hard. He was just flat out at everything. Great clubman. Do I, do I. My, my uh, I was going to bring up Zilla too, uh, Matty, was I reckon after a game one day, Stan said to him, I reckon you've lost the eye of the Tiger, Zills. And we went to Flaming Moe's that night and Zills was hooking in pretty hard. And at the bottom of every en- empty stubby, he was looking in going, oh, the Tiger's not in there. I'll keep looking though. I'll keep looking. <laughs> uh, hook, hooked in a bit, Zills. Great, great man. He Do you remember Zill's uh, impersonations of Stan? He had the best impersonations yeah. of Stan ever. Probably better yeah. than Stan himself. <laughs> <laughs> if that's possible. I think Laser was the, the one, yeah, talking yeah. about. I, he introduced himself to me as Shifty. So uh, <laughs> at the time, I'm thinking, What's this, who's, what does Shifty mean? But I think over, over the course of the next month or two, we'll realise what the, what the word Shifty means when he's especially. <laughs> Car dealership, so. <laughs> uh, uh, pl- plenty of characters that come and go in footy clubs and uh, abs- absolute privilege to play with you three characters early days and yeah, just a shame it wasn't a bit longer. Um, yeah, your good self went to the Hawks, Joel, and, and Lapo over to the Blue Baggers and um, I was and I had a few more years and the three of you had many more years after that, but all their great careers, and it was uh, yeah, great that we keep in touch and, and reminisce from time to time, especially at this time with the clubs dedicating the last couple of weeks to the 90s era. So yeah, it's a tough time for all, but yeah, hope your families are well and look forward to keeping in touch. Thanks, Brando. Thanks, Brandy. Thanks for organising all this, Brando. Great to have a chat. Nice work.